Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, very fortunate to be hosting this session. I think this is an excellent initiative by Dr. Pramod Jain as well. Well, the session which we have today, uh, what I realized is, is very ambitious. And I say it's very ambitious because uh, we are actually talking about China's neighbors. Uh, and China's neighbors, you're not just restricted to South Asia, but uh, it's, it's actually China's neighborhood. And if you look at the participants, we have seven participants. Definitely, this is going to be a very interesting session. Uh, despite its ambition, because the paper panelists, the panelists which you see here, actually will be talking about issues uh, ranging from China's immediate uh, neighborhood, say in South Asia, Central Asia, and Indo-Pacific. So uh, maybe I will start with the order that the organizers have uh, uh, clarified in the paper itself, in the schedule itself. We have uh, Dr. Abiruchi Oja. Uh, Dr. Abiruchi Oja, if uh, you can just unmute yourself and uh, uh, just tell the others uh, that uh, you are here in the panel. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, thank you. We have uh, Ms. Victoria Ivancheko. If you can just unmute yourself and tell the, uh, 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 the audience that you are there. Yes, good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon, thank you. Um, Ms. Uh, Manisha Mahalingam. She's a risk analyst intern. I'm here. Wonderful. Uh, Ms. Sampriti Biswas. She's a doctoral candidate, JNU. Uh, hello. Yeah, yeah, I'm here, ma'am. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Bharti Chibhar. She's a professor at the University of Delhi. Yeah, I'm here, ma'am. Um, Ms. Julia uh, Sophia Kusela. She's a student. Good Greetings afternoon. from Moscow. Wonderful. Thank you. And Ipshita Bhattacharya, she's an assistant professor, Jagran Lake City University. Ipshita, are you there? Uh, are you there, Ipshita? Okay, so we have six panelists on the table. Um, as I said, the uh, themes which they're going to speak on are very diverse, but yes, uh, very, very interesting too, primarily from a geostrategic perspective. Um, as uh, Dr. Jaiswal had uh, clarified, um, we get around 10 to 12 minutes to present. Please don't exceed beyond 10 minutes. Uh, we will be wanting to have a good interactive session. Uh, so uh, Dr. Abiruji Oja, over to you now, please. You have 10 minutes starting now. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, uh... Good afternoon, everybody. Greetings from Kashmir. Uh, let me begin by thanking Dr. Pramod and uh, Team NICE for bringing us together for this conference. Uh, it is indeed refreshing to have an uh, international women's summit. Uh, since we are pressed on time, let me straight away to my paper, which is titled From Margins to the Center, Centrality of Ladakh in India-China Tension. I intentionally kept the title somewhat misleading. Uh, because I want to deconstruct the idea of centrality in context of Ladakh. Uh, the uh, NICE team will be handling my PPT, uh, and I will tell you when uh, you need to change, and thank you so much for uh, sort of providing me that uh, support. In the past few months, uh, we can be forgiven for thinking that Ladakh is at the center of the recent Indochina border dispute. A lot of work has come out, both academic and in popular media, have Ladakh in their title, which makes us think Conception. The world is talking about Ladakh while not really talking about Ladakh. In other words, people of Ladakh are missing in this discourse. Their voices unheard. Their lived experience continue to be at the margins. Next slide, please. The first part of my paper deconstructs how Ladakh appears to be central uh, while its people remain at the margin in the current debate. The second section attempts to put the people of Ladakh at the center. And the concluding section discusses a brief uh, in some large concerns and questions from a feminist standpoint. Next slide, please. Let me begin by deconstructing centrality of Ladakh. The centrality of Ladakh in present discourse is statist. One where Indian and Chinese perspectives converge in viewing Ladakh from a purely strategic angle. 
From the Chinese state's perspective, Ladakh is important uh, because of Tibet connection and more recently for Belt and Road Initiative. From Indian state's perspective, Ladakh has a strategic location, uh, which is for its territorial security. Thus, for both India and China, Ladakh has territorial importance, nothing more. Next slide, please. Do we see a problem here? This projection of Ladakh as a strategic territory with no human base is uh, deeply problematic. It views Ladakh with a limited territorial lens. Next slide. Some of you might have noticed that in recent news reports, both India and China, uh, Ladakh has often been represented by satellite pictures with discussions by experts trying to locate which army is camped where. This preoccupation reduces Ladakh to a mere territorial expanse with no human face. The people of Ladakh are Wait, not only, I... are, uh, are only in this discourse by their complete absence. Next slide. The question is, how do we bring Ladakh truly to the center? This is challenging because in conventional IR, territoriality remains at the center stage. An ontological and epistemological reimagination is required to move beyond status preoccupation. Only then the marginality of lived experiences of Ladakhi people can be centered and given its proper due. Next slide. Let me start with Ladakh's story. Ladakh's historical and political choices led it to be part of India. However, Ladakh has remained in the margins even within India for a long time. Formerly, when Ladakh was part of the state of Jammu and Kashmir, the Kash Kashmir conflict dominated the discourse. And Ladakh remained visible, unnamed territory of the state. Even the removal of Article 370 got played internationally and nationally as uh, having consequences only for Kashmir. Being made a union territory has given Ladakh a separate identity. However, whether this move will provide any possibility for uh, speaking and being heard remains to be seen. Next slide. Ladakhi uh, demand people-centric development uh, with protections for their unique cultural identity, similar to the ones offered to tribal areas in rest of India. Many Ladakhis are also concerned about their fragile ecosystem and are worried about greedy neoliberal developmentalism being unleashed on them, which can damage their environment as well as their cultural identity. Moreover, uh, are the infrastructure development since Ladakh uh, for the benefit of the people or predominantly for military convenience. People of Ladakh are also increasingly concerned about excessive militarization and the accompanying problems. Next slide. These concerns of Ladakhis continue to remain much at the margins of the present discourse. Hence, in many ways, the lived experiences of people of Ladakh and their real concerns are not getting their due in the present debate. Till that happens, the border might become secure, but Ladakhis will remain alienated. Next slide. What broader lessons can be derived from this? I propose some suggestions and flag uh, some questions from a feminist standpoint. Uh, we have to start how to make discourse in IR more inclusive and people-centric. Where are the Ladakhi intellectuals in the present debate? The discourse has been dominated by Delhi and Beijing elites. To put Ladakh truly in the center, one has to listen to Ladakhi voices. Ladakh's agency should be respected and given its due. In broader sense, one can say the same about smaller states in the international system whose viewpoints are often ignored, uh, their agency taken for granted by bigger states. Sri Lanka or Maldives are often discussed only um, in context of in, uh, India-China Ch India relations, with very little uh, appreciation of the autonomy and independent of these states. 
This only hinders cooperation and trust between states. Secondly, we are going to talk about Ladakh or any such marginalized region only uh, when there is a dispute or a conflict and forget about these people and their aspirations in other times. The notion of masculine protectionism of a feminized territory to be taken or saved by competing states is not to serve any greater benefit. Neither will rendering the people voiceless by continuously speaking for them. This is true for Ladakh and is true for any similar region or state in any other part of the world. We have to find ways to move beyond the toxic masculinity of the modern nation state. Moreover, we are living in times of pandemic. It is an extraordinary time in human history. It's tragic that even in this uh, sort of time, uh, territoriality and border remains more significant to state than human lives. Militarism backed by jingoistic nationalism has led to further militarization of border. In South Asia, both India and Pakistan have moved large number of troops to their borders. And so has China. This is happening in an already militarized zone and a nuclear flashpoint. There is large support for further militarization through warmongering by the media and rallying of chest thumping experts in both sides. Next slide. However, the pandemic ha has exposed not only the global powers we have, uh, a weak public system, but also a faulty sense of power which pushes people to the margins and empty satellite images to the center. Feminists have long talked about importance of human security and have argued that this should be given equal importance to national security. False hierarchical dichotomies between high politics and low politics have been questioned by feminist scholars in IR. The present pandemic has vindicated them COVID-19 has killed so far nearly 50 times more people than 9-11 in US. In India too, more people have died because of it than in border clashes or due to terrorism. Myth-making of strong masculine nationalistic states have been proven to be giants with feet of clay. The need of the hour is people-centric approaches to security, uh, conflict transformation, and development. Only if we are made, uh, people are made to the center of the discourse, we will truly be talking about marginalized regions and its people instead of pretending to be doing so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oja, uh, for sticking to the time. I think that was very efficient. And and you did raise a lot of significant issues, questions, uh, which need to be addressed uh, by IR scholarship. Uh, but uh, without any further delay, uh, because I'm sure your presentation would be having questions uh, from people at large, I'll reserve my comments for the end of uh, the, the panel, for the end of the panel of the presentations get over. But we can now move on to the uh, second speaker. Um, and the name uh, of, the, of our second speaker is Miss Victoria Ivan. If I'm pronouncing your name, correctly. yes, Victoria, please. Yes, um, good afternoon again. Um, greetings from Russia. Well, for me, uh, this session is also have to, uh, a little bit ambitious, as I'm not a specialist in China, but uh, I will try to focus uh, on the um, uh, issue of migration to Russia, especially uh, exactly on the Chinese. Uh, 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 perspective, and uh, I study most of all such of power and public diplomacy, so I'm going to focus from this perspective. Uh, first of all, I have to say that uh, migration to Russia is a quite uh, sensitive question for Russian people, and uh, there is still a lot of um, fears and uh, discourse against migrants, especially labor migrants, because people tend to think that those people are the threat to Russia. And um, if we look at the statistics from uh, since um, 2010 and by 2018, uh, 2019, uh, the first three countries uh, of which uh, I can say supply most of migrants to Russia are Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, which are Central Asian countries, and then China. So China takes the third place. 
Uh, but uh, indeed, China uh, Chinese migrants are not labor migrants, and 72 percent of all coming Chinese to Russia are tourists. So uh, it's more about the question of tourism industry. Uh, the uh, amount, uh, the number of uh, Chinese migrants which uh, try to um, invest or try to create their business here um, is not really high and uh, the uh, de degree of, um, you can say, uh, of uh, people which come each year um, is uh, like, I guess, 10%, if I'm not mistaken. and. Uh, uh, only a very small part of Chinese try to uh, uh, to ask for a Russian citizenship. And uh, for example, during uh, the previous year, 2019, only 1,000 of Chinese uh, were accepted into the Russian citizenship. So the threat, uh, which especially in the 90s, into, uh, in the beginning of the 21st century uh, inside Russia, uh, concern in China is not uh, real, I can say. Of course, there are some uh, still clashes uh, in the border uh, regions, I mean, about the business of uh, Russian and Chinese, and uh, some of Russians are not uh, very happy uh, with the process which happened, for example, at Baikal. Uh, but in general, uh, I can say that uh, the threat is overestimated and um, uh, those migration uh, is more about tourists. And again, it's more about uh, attraction of Russia as a tourist country, uh, not only in the Far East or Siberia, not only Baikal, but also a lot of Chinese usually come to such big cities as Moscow and St. Petersburg. And I guess that uh, it was one of the very important to the, the industry. But again, there is another challenge, and by the way, just uh, the day before uh, the Russian government uh, took a new uh, law uh, that uh, foreign uh, uh, citizens cannot be uh, guides, I mean, in the tourist groups. And it was really a challenge because when Chinese come to Russia, they usually have uh, uh, the tourist uh, guide from China, which talk Chinese, and it's usually not Russian companies which are arrange uh, uh, tourism uh, and arrange uh, tours, uh, but those uh, Chinese companies. So it means that Russia didn't get really uh, much income because of uh, tourism from China, and uh, uh, that also uh, created some economic losses. Uh, also, um, another challenge uh, concerning Russia-Chinese uh, migration was about uh, immigration from China to the Far East and Siberia. On the one hand, uh, Russia needs labor migrants, and uh, on the one hand, uh, it is important for the economy. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, Russians are very skeptical about labor migration from other countries, and uh, there were uh, threats which I mentioned, and uh, they still exist, that uh, Chinese will softly occupy Far East uh, in, the, in Russia and maybe in perspective Siberia. And still, uh, the, um, even the model of tourism to Baikal uh, creates a lot of uh, disagreement, and uh, that is why the law I mentioned was uh, adopted, so, so to create uh, more opportunities for Russian tourism uh, firms and uh, to exclude some, you know, uh, Chinese oriented business inside Russia, I can say. Uh, and uh, as well, uh, and um, China um, have not very big, but anyway, a competition uh, on migration from other countries. Um, as I mentioned, uh, most, um, the, the biggest numbers from uh, migrants are from the Central Asia. And uh, as well, uh, it is very interesting that it's of course not only labor migration, but also the educational migration or migration of higher qualified uh, specialists. And uh, here we can see that uh, uh, labor migration, which doesn't need some special uh, qualification, which usually um, labor in the sphere of service, uh, you know, to clean the streets and so on. 
those people go to Russia and of course some of them also go for education or to um, obtain a higher education and then to um, their career in Russia, but usually Central Asian uh, citizens, they then choose up to Russia to go to China or to go to the Western countries. And here we can see the real um, challenge for Russia so far for attractiveness because uh, Russia cannot be the um, last, I can say, goal and just like uh, uh, some period to move further and shows uh, uh, usually that uh, uh, Russia does not have enough, uh, unfortunately, attractive potential for that, and it's also a challenge because the uh, Chinese uh, education system now created uh, a lot of um, attractive uh, opportunities for citizens from the post-Soviet space at all, and it is quite popular for such countries as Kazakhstan, uh, even Kyrgyzstan, and uh, those uh, countries which I mentioned, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. Uh, at the same time, Central Asian countries are also um, afraid of, of Chinese, I can say, expansion. Uh, that's how they uh, pronounce it. Of course, uh, it's still a question uh, how dreadful it is, and, but uh, there is some in very internal domestic fears about the influence of China because we usually you know that small countries are afraid of uh, big uh, neighbors. And uh, uh, here uh, they um, appeal to Russia as to the country which can help uh, to balance in this case and um, not only in migrational um, perspective, but in general in the development of the region. And uh, here um, another uh, challenge for Russia is uh, to create, I could say, good conditions for migrants uh, to uh, make those people which want to create, create to build career in Russia to stay, because uh, there is uh, a really a very big trend that people uh, do not want to stay and do not want to invest uh, in development uh, thanks to migration. And uh, I guess during the last five years, uh, Russia also began to lose positions uh, in the uh, list of uh, attractive countries uh, which um, attract migrants uh, and especially those uh, who are qualified for. Um, uh, concerning the Chinese case, uh, the regulation, I can say, of migration causes is very important to Russia as well because of uh, the pivot to the east, uh, which was uh, proclaimed in 2015 and even before uh, they were trans to uh, turn to the east and uh, also there is uh, uh, due to develop far east regions and um, the problem that people from uh, those regions usually migrate to the central part of Russia and uh, they as well um, live for big cities like St. Petersburg and Moscow. And because of that, Russia has to attract, uh, to ask to come other people, uh, including Chinese people. Uh, of course, uh, I do not uh, personally, as uh, I think in concerning the problem of soft power, I don't think that uh, now, especially Chinese threat is uh, that big uh, because um, Chinese citizens are not interested in uh, moving to Russian cities uh, now, uh, there is not many inquiring in, inquiries, um, so in, inquiries uh, for the Russian citizenship, and uh, usually they just come uh, temporarily to uh, uh, just uh, business and to. to Uh, perspective because it really got migrations central 
to Russia and Asia, which again, IR scholarship needs to engage with. Now, I'm sure there would be questions. Uh, what I would uh, urge our audiences to do is to please type the questions uh, in the chat box and maybe we'll take all of them later. Uh, thank you. We now move on uh, to our uh, third uh, speaker. So our third speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Mani uh, it's Manisha Mahalingam. Um, she's a risk analyst intern, and she's going to speak on turtling dragon head in the Indo-Pacific response to COVID-19 backlash or grand strategy. So that's a very interesting title. Uh, over to you, uh, Manisha, now. Thank you for that introduction. So as said, my, artic my article is titled China's Daring Head in the Indo-Pacific Region is it response to COVID-19 or grand strategy. So the aim of my paper was primarily, uh, can you all, okay. the aim of the paper was to ascertain the Chinese assertiveness, the rise in Chinese assertiveness, and whether it is China merely exploiting the COVID-19 pandemic to gain geopolitical traction or whether it, the military clashes are an expression of a larger political agenda particularly in the Indo-Pacific region. So my finding was that both notions uh, cross paths. Uh, so my paper is divided into four parts. I'll quickly dive into them. Uh, the Galwan Valley uh, violence that India witnessed recently signaled a change in China foreign policy. Because for over 54 years, China had not resorted to violence when it come, came to dealing with Indo uh, border issues. And this case was not in isolation. In 2020, China was particularly active and we saw various instances of Chinese assertiveness or aggressiveness, particularly in the Indochina where it clashed with Malaysia, Vietnam, Japan, and Australia. Of maybe uh, perhaps the best example of Chinese provocativeness or assertiveness is the security law that China passed recently. In despite of international criticism and uh, incredible opposition, it forged ahead. And this assertive Chinese diplomacy has been dubbed uh, the wolf warrior diplomacy. It's named after uh, Chinese action movies of the same uh, name, and it embodies the aggressive jingoism taken by the Chinese diplomats to defend, in order to defend China's national interest. My take is that the right the warrior back that the country has been receiving since the onset of the pandemic, both for being the country of origin and uh, and as well as being one of the first one to recover. The backlash has been in many forms, uh, majorly coming out of the US, with the US elections around the corner, Trump and his members, team members of all, uh, they're campaigning on anti-China sentiments. And, Chinese, uh, and US statements against Chinese assertiveness have become a daily affair. When it comes to Twitter spats, this is where we are seeing a lot of examples, uh, witnessing uh, Chinese diplomats exhibiting wolf warrior behavior. For instance, when China was recently criticized about the quality of its COVID medical kits, uh, a spokesperson of the foreign ministry took to Twitter to say in extremely harsh and brash tones that, you know, if you do not want Chinese products, then why are you buying our products? Uh, I, China per perhaps perceives this severe backlash as Having one that no one can expect China to swallow the bitter fruit, the bitter fruit that is harmful to its sovereignty, integrity, security, and interest. Perhaps this is just China. Uh, this is perhaps the wolf warrior, Perhaps this is why wolf warrior diplomacy is on the rise. There are other theorists who believe that you know the pandemic has nothing to do with Chinese assertiveness. China has always been uh, uh, aggressive in its approach, and it's all just part. Uh, so Swain and Tellis in, in their book, Interpreting Grand Strategy, they highlighted three objectives, uh, speaking about uh, China's, um, China's need to protect its domestic order or be it, it, uh, be it its defense against any threat that it perceives to its national sovereignty or territory or to attain global influence, but it may be uh, uh, primarily in, this, uh, in the neighborhood of China being the Indo-Pacific. We will notice how similar these grand strategy objectives as identified by Spain and TELUS are to the core 
interest underline that china as we know china holds its core interest as top priority and they very and the indo pacific falls can be read well within the core interest its activities are very are in furtherance of these core interests though surprisingly china has never mentioned the term indo pacific region in any of its uh, official documents but it's a major stakeholder in uh, and, and a participant in the indo pacific be it for territory so a bit for economic or security reasons i believe both the views uh, notions cross path on one side we have the notion that uh, the rise in chinese aggression is linked to covid 19 on the other hand we have the notion that no it's all just part of a political agenda both views cross paths where on one side there is a bold and assertive china that is that is in response to the west's attempt to impose its values down china's throat there's, there's a sense of a siege that china china is facing right now with internationalism and and countries unifying against china it's feeling a sense of siege and perhaps it's just a wounded or cornered animal turning back to bite on the other hand the indo pacific is a so the pandemic is a perfect time advantageous time for china to further its political agenda the us supremacy is decline is on a, a steady decline the european union any of its nations are extremely crippled by the pandemic russia is not in a position to challenge china so china is in a extremely prime position to further its national interest core interest or whatever it was to uh, in, in the indo pacific region and this is particularly backed by its confidence from having efficiently dealt with the pandemic so can the wolf sustain is can the wolf sustain is the question to be asked uh, i believe that it would be very hard for them to continue to forge ahead uh, continue to being assertive because there's a enormous rise in anti china sentiments and it is uniting indo pacific like before what with new quad plus with new members like new zealand vietnam and uh, south korea have become prominent or emerging as a prominent player in the indo pacific and the past few months we have seen india and other countries in the indo pacific strengthening their ties with other part uh, other um, interest sharers um, for example india and us summit india and australia summit and in all these summits it's interesting to notice that they all have mentioned that they uh, they uh, they they want to believe they want to strive for a open and free indo pacific region can uh, the australia's new defense strategy update is also an excellent indicator because it has it, it was a paradigm shift this update was a paradigm shift it pivoted from defensive posture to a deterrence posture it is upping its military capabilities and security posture in the indo pacific region can china amend its foreign policy uh, can it yes it can but will it is the question uh in 2019 when china, in an asean summit when china was asked its opinions on indo china region its uh, its minister said that it hopes the other part other countries when participating in the region will engage in geo without will engage so without going into geographical confrontations or games funny because is exactly what china is doing right now so perhaps it's time for china to take its own advice uh if it continues to go uh, continues to uh, be a uh, follow foreign policy dominated by the wolf uh, there is a fear of the two sided trap or an inevitable war as the, there is increasing tensions between us and um, between china and to uh, to avoid war the only possible way would be for both the challenger and the challenged to make painful amendments to their uh, agendas and right now the ball is in china's court i conclude there so wonderful uh, uh manisha i think uh, you did stick to time um one uh, point which in fact came to my mind while you were presenting is that where is the chinese perspective in it uh in other words what i mean to say that uh have you really looked at how does china really define its own grand strategy and and when i say that uh what i essentially mean is uh is is that you know how does china actually define power how does china define war how does china define peace and therefore this particular uh vocabulary or i would say this particular term which you invoke here wolf warrior diplomacy where does it come from um so uh with that maybe we'll move on to the uh, next uh, presenter and the next presenter we have in front of us is uh, is miss sampriti biswas uh, she's a doctoral candidate jnu and uh, again she's going to speak about a very interesting triad here uh, russia china pakistan engagement and its implications on russia yeah in
be our child. So uh, let let's see how you actually uh, make us walk forward uh, in uh, you know through the topic which you have selected for yourself. But yes, uh, looking forward to it. Uh, your time starts now. You have around ten minutes. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the introduction. Am I audible? Yes, you are. So since I'm a student of uh, Russian studies, uh, I am going to present this paper from the perspective of Russia's foreign policy. So to begin with, Russia-China-Pakistan engagement has mostly come to be explained in realist terms with the usage of terminologies like axis or counter-strategic alliance by scholars and political analysts. In their explanations, the overriding factor shaping such an alliance or axis is Russia-China-Pakistan's interest in pushing for a counter to the US-India ties in the region. Another line of realist thinking notes that the primary force behind such an alliance is only just watching the US from the region, but also to counter China's growing status as a countervailing power in the region. Now, this paper seeks to rationalize that the above factors as presented in the realist narratives are inadequate in explaining the nature of uh, this engagement in the light of A, Russia's invested relationship with India, which makes it highly unlikely for Russia to turn against India. B, Russia's tactical relationship with Pakistan. C, Russia's comprehensive partnership with China. D, the lack of any strategic agreement between USA and India to counter Russia and China. And most importantly, E, Russia's concern to institutionalize a regional mechanism to mitigate the menace of terrorism emanating from the Afghan territory in a bid to safeguard its own territorial integrity. Now, I'm to have these things. Firstly, in view of Russia's time tested ties with India, it is difficult to sustain that Russia will cooperate with China and Pakistan to thwart India's growing presence in the region. A comparative analysis of Russia's strategic, economic, and defense ties with India, China, and Pakistan reveals that Russia's relationship with India has been extremely invested, cutting across several spheres as both countries have assisted each other at crucial junctures of history ever since the Indo-Soviet Treaty on Peace, Friendship, and Cooperation was signed in August 1971. This cannot be said of a China, uh, Russia-China or Russia-Pakistan relations. Though Russia and China have presently upgraded their bilateral relations to the level of comprehensive strategic partnership, yet historically, Indo-Russian ties have stood the test of time, unlike Russia-China relations at past. In terms of Russia's defense ties with India, China, and Pakistan, 60% of Russian arms export went to China and Oceania from 2014 to 18 with India being the chief recipient of Russian arms followed by China. Moreover, at the backdrop of the recent increasing animosity between India and China, Russia, on India's insistence, has assured to transfer the S-400 anti-missile system to India at the soonest. While it is true that Russia is warming up to Pakistan, as has been evident from the multitude of joint military exercises and defense deals from 2014 onwards, yet, these uh, deals are mostly joint counterterrorism, uh, are mostly uh, aimed at joint counterterrorism exercises. Moreover, the Pakistani military is handicapped by a lack of resources to invest in Russian origin military systems, unlike India or China. Therefore, Russia's defense creation with challenges. A study of Russia's trade relations with India, China, and Pakistan shows that its bilateral trade with Pakistan stood at a mere $800 million at the end of 2018, which was below potential, while Russia's economic relations with India is stunted compared to Russia-China economic ties, yet it is nevertheless registering impressive, economic, uh, impressive growth rates compared to the preceding years. For example, according to the figures provided by uh, the Confederation of Indian Industries, total trade in, at the end of 2017 between India and Russia went up by 7.5 billion uh, US dollars, uh, registering an impressive growth rate of 22%. As the two-way investment succeeded in crossing the 30 billion mark, uh, mark, both sides have enhanced the figure to $50 billion to be achieved by 2025. Moreover, Prime Minister 
Narendra Modi, how he, at your address at the India uh, Russia Business Summit, uh, declared the creation of the Russia Plus system to provide support, support to Russian investors in India. In terms of public perception and the dynamics of public attitude among the Russians towards India, China, and Pakistan, the Levada Center, which is the only non governmental pollster in Russia, in its survey identified India as one of the country's top allies. Though it reassured of the Druzva Dosti's relationship's intactness, yet it also added that Russia's perception of China was gradually becoming better. While Pakistan doesn't feature as one of the top five allies of Russia, according to the survey. This analysis of Russia's ties with India at the strategic defense and economic level, along with uh, in terms of public perception, reveal that though China is gradually developing a robust relationship with Russia and seeing ties with Pakistan, both these countries are yet to catch up with Russia-India ties that enjoy a mutually beneficial relationship and goodwill steeped in historical nostalgia. Therefore, it is highly unlikely for Russia to turn against India. Secondly, many scholars are arguing that Russia's recalibration of ties with Pakistan may not, uh, uh, may, not may prove harmful uh, for Russia's interest, uh, uh, and uh, New Delhi may, be, uh, may not be satisfied with uh, Russia coming closer to Pakistan. But if we look closely at Russia's foreign policy concepts and doctrines, we can see that uh, there is a fragmented Pakistan policy on the part of Russia. A scrutiny of Russia's foreign policy concepts and other doctrinal documents reveal that Pakistan wasn't mentioned in any of uh, Russian Federation's foreign policy concepts except for once in 2008. More the agreement that signed uh, post-2014 with Pakistan have mostly hinted towards military cooperation with regard to the instability in Afghanistan. A Russian president is yet to visit Pakistan, and the energy and military deals that have been signed between Russia and Pakistan appear insignificant compared to Russia's economic and strategic collaborations with India or China. Under such circumstances, it is too soon to talk of a Russia-China-Pakistan axis as two of the component states of the so-called axis, Russia and Pakistan, are yet to overcome their fragmented policies towards each other. Thirdly, scholars who opine that Russia desires to diminish China's role in the region succumbs to the rationalist narrative of conceiving Russia-China relations as either confrontational or cooperative. The adoption of this binary has been inadequate and restrictive in explaining the changing dimensions of Russia-China relations in the new geopolitical setting of the post-Cold War period. Russia's comprehensive cooperative engagement with China at the strategic level, as reflected from the multitude of joint declarations, has spilled over to other sectors like the economy and the military. Therefore, any analysis of Russia-China strategic relations should adopt a more interpretive approach, which should suggest that not all decisions and policies are governed by the systemic structure. Rather, it results from an array of factors that include domestic political developments marked by the rise and fall of groups of political elites, economic conditions, internal threats emanating from separatism, cross-border terrorism, and so on. When analyzed from this perspective, the realist narrative that presents the primary force behind this China's growing status as a country by in the region does not hold water. Fourthly, the other, that is US and China, vis-a-vis -vis which the realist attempt to present the Russia-China-Pakistan axis as a counter-strategic alliance is itself non-institutionalized and fraught with many challenges. India and US have no doubt deepened their bilateral cooperation that has been evident from the 2 plus 2 dialogue held in September 2018 and the signing of the Kompasa. Both the countries' declaration of commitment with regard to the Indo-Pacific region has demonstrated their assessment of China as a regional disruptor, yet the chances of any formal strategic cooperation agreement between India and US to counter China appears bleak. India is also apprehensive of the U.S. in the light of the latter's, uh, latter's America first policy. 
including American versus sanctions and other anti-market policies that run counter to India's national interest. Lastly, and most importantly, this paper argues that Russia-China-Pakistan engagement has been shaped by the Afghan problem, which has proved to be the primary determinant. All three states have high stakes in the stability of Afghanistan due to their geographical contiguity to the region. Though Russia doesn't shed direct borders with Afghanistan, unlike Pakistan and China, yet anticipation of spillover of extremist forces to Russia through the former Soviet republics of Central Asia has led Russia to initiate several deliberative processes to quell these extremist forces in Afghanistan. And this is well reflected from what has come to be known as the Moscow process. Therefore, the realist vision of the trilateral cooperation as a strategic counter alliance put in the water in the light of the arguments provided. Though India's ties with the US have improved, but to reason that it is a major factor driving Russia's growing relations with China and Pakistan is to succumb to the realist concept of a power-centric and relative gain approach that excludes important factors from its explanation. One such factor is the need of the globalized world that demands cross-country cooperation even when certain confrontational issues exist. The need for such cooperation cutting across state borders have become all the more significant in the light of new threats emanating across the globe. Thus, as already reiterated, it is the situation in Afghanistan that is primarily shaping Russia-China-Pakistan engagement. Most scholars have anticipated that Moscow's warming stance towards Islamabad will not go down well with New Delhi, but Russian policymakers have time and again uh, by including India in its effort towards institution, uh, instituting macro-regional multilateralism, therefore proving that, Russia, uh, that India is an important ally for Russia and South Asia. The second round, dis, uh, second round of discussions of the Moscow process, which was held on, uh, on 15th... You wind up your argument, sorry for being so nasty, but you have no, to wind up your yeah. yeah, sure, just, just a couple of more sentences. So, uh, like uh, the Moscow, pro the, the second round of the Moscow process, which was held in 2017, for example, for the first time saw both India and Pakistan agreeing to negotiate at the same negotiating table, and this was possible because of Russia. Therefore, if Russia, China, and Pakistan actually are able to initiate a successful peace process in Afghanistan, it will not only be credited of bringing stability to the region, but it will actually inch closer uh, to uh, promoting the values related to multilateralism and a multipolar world order. Thank you. So I think you have the questions there. I'm sure uh, we will have questions. It's quite encouraging to see that there are many questions now in the chat box. I would also urge our speakers to have a look at the chat box and really think of uh, the answers uh, they have to respond to. That'll save time. Uh, but now we move on to the fifth uh, presentation, and that's by uh, Dr. Bharti Chibir, uh, who's a professor at the University of Delhi. And uh, she yet is going to get another perspective to the table today. He will be talking about the ASEAN way approach to Southeast Asia in Asia's Indo-Pacific outlook. So over to you, uh, Dr. Chipper. You have 10 minutes. Uh, please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. Dr. Chibber, please unmute yourself. Yes. We can. Uh, am I audible now? Yes. Am I audible? Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Megha. Uh, well, um, I'll be speaking about ASEAN way approach uh, of Southeast Asia towards the Indo-Pacific region, and I'll be uh, cutting short my paper as we have limited time. And uh, basically, it will be into four short. Um, points uh, rather which I'll be highlighting about what exactly is the ASEAN way and what is the ASEAN way approach to South um, ASEAN way approach of Southeast Asia to Indo-Pacific and the critique of the approach and finally the positivities in the approach. Well, uh, when we talk about ASEAN way, we actually go back to 1967 or rather even before that when ASEAN was actually formed and ASEAN was actually formed in order to institutionalize the whole process of uh, reconciliation, you know, which paved the way for end of uh, confrontasi, Indo Indonesia's confrontasi against the 
the uh, institutes. So from the very beginning, the whole idea behind the formation of ASEAN itself was about national security via regional security and vice versa. And uh, national resilience uh, uh, paved the way for uh, building a national identity as well as externally it also uh, was seen in terms of resolving the common problems that the region was facing. And in 2008, uh, ASEAN Charter actually formalized all or codified all these ASEAN norms and values which we um, see in the form of ASEAN way. Uh, for example, mutual respect for independence and sovereignty of the nations, uh, mutual coexistence, non-interference, renunciation of use of force as a means of resolving conflicts and settlement of uh, disputes by peaceful means. Now, the whole idea is that uh, this is nothing new. How do I adopted this in order to ensure that uh, there's cohesion, order, and civility among members in dealing with each other actually uh, is called ASEAN way. And it's a kind of a diplomatic norm shared by the members uh, on the basis of uh, non-use of force diplomacy in decision making which was very informal, incremental kind of approach based on consultation and dialogue. So it's a basically quiet diplomacy where bilateral tensions, uh, they are not, um, they are not flayed up uh, you know, in, in the context of resulting in a war. And in the same context, uh, Karl Deutsch has mentioned that ASEAN probably has reached something called security community, where members do not resort to war in order to resolve their differences. So the whole idea behind the ASEAN uh, way in terms of uh, domestic stability to regional goals is ASEAN. And um, it's basically also created something which, which is called non-coercive -co non arguments or a kind of a familiarity, a kind of a process of socialization in the sense that um, uh, persuasion uh, in terms of a process which result uh, in resolution of the conflicts. So the means to resolve the conflicts or the means to dialogue was more important than the end itself, you know. Uh, this approach has been criticized by uh, many people in terms of being very slow. Uh, however, it has, um, it has borne fruit for the ASEAN. <clears throat> for example, 1976 in Treaty of um, was codified. Also, uh, Southeast Asia has also um, declared itself as a nuclear weapons free zone in 19, uh, initially tried in 1971 but could not because of Indo China crisis. But later on, after also in 1995, Southeast Asia nuclear weapons free zone, you know, GG was also signed, you know. So basically, this ASEAN Bay approach has, has grown to be very resilient over the years. And uh, another example can be when Ekino uh, took over in Philippines, the member states or the leaders of the member countries actually visited it, uh, in spite of the threat perspective, you know, in order to uh, show solidarity. Also, when uh, the West, you know, was critical of Myanmar, they actually engaged with Myanmar. So that means this ASEAN Bay approach is very dynamic. It's not static. It's not static, like from non-interference the countries have moved to something called flexible engagement to constructive engagement with the member states in order to ensure that uh, the crisis they uh, are resolved. So ASEAN Bay approach is very, very relevant even in contemporary times because it's still uh, to the region. Coming to uh, the present context, you know, when we talk about the ASEAN Bay approach in terms of how it, um, is uh, seen as, uh, as an important uh, concept in the Indo-Pacific region. In 2019, June, uh, based on the Indonesian uh, pers earlier perspective, the ASEAN actually suggested or came up with this outlook, which uh, was a very short kind of an approach or hi hi highlighted about how uh, the countries or the ASEAN should, uh, should be playing a very central role in the um, Southeast Asia, in the Indo-Pacific region, and how they're going to be integrating and interconnecting the uh, whole region. Uh, well, uh, it was based on, as I said, the principle of centrality, but this principle of centrality is not only about geographical connotation of ASEAN, 
also about us which was criticized for not criticizing china or for um, not mentioning about uh, as different from us in terms of uh, free um, and open indo pacific region it talks about inclusive uh, indo pacific region but then here uh, we have to understand that asean is not european union european union was based on pooling of the sovereignty in terms of uh, uh, european parliament but asean is all about non legal uh, method of cooperation based on uh, uh, consensus building based on confidence building so this approach was based uh, on uh, uh, the indo pacific approach is based on this uh, tested formula of asean also uh, the member state presently they do have little divergent views for example indonesia uh, was not uh, too much in favor of quad taking it to be an external um, coalition however with the present virtual meeting with quad plus gets so going beyond uh, the four um, uh, external powers is involving asean also so uh, that means the asean bay is very very um, appropriate for the um, southeast asian countries because it has tested they they believe that they want to uh, be a regional consensus builder they want to have an independent foreign policy they do not want the external countries to uh, bring about certain new laws or certain new uh, methods of um, dealing with each other in the indo pacific region so if we see asean uh, uh, asean way approach or if we see the uh, southeast asia's indo pacific approach from this perspective then it seems that one uh, as i said it's very time tested kind of approach uh, it has borne fruit for the asean countries uh, it has resulted in uh, uh, issues are def- definitely there challenges but it has stopped them from actually going to war for uh, many years so that means uh, it can be continued as an approach in the indo pacific region and also as i said earlier it's not a static it's a dynamic approach so from from uh, non interference to flexible engagement uh, it has moved with changing times in terms of changing technology uh, the only problem is uh, certain divergence among the member states itself this is something that the asean countries have to take care of uh, in order to ensure that they actually play a critical and central role in the indo pacific region i'll rest with that thank you professor chibur for again stepping uh, uh, you know sticking up to time and i think that was a, a very uh, interesting perspective that you brought to the table and i'm saying it's an interesting perspective because uh, one has as a student of international or is any way from asean bay and what i really see here that you took this interpretation of the asean bay to another level where uh, you equated uh, the diplomacy of asean states with i would say three key features which become essential to understand diplomatic practice which is flexibility flexibility dynamism and resilience and i think you know just three words just to make a lot of sense primarily not only from the perspective as to how would the collective of asean states really respond uh, to issues but i think a larger theoretical question in terms of uh, the asian diplomatic nuances which one really gets when one is really uh, studying the geopolitical theater uh, in asia uh, so uh, i hope you uh, do get uh, this paper published but uh, i'm sure we would be having uh, questions and uh, i would uh, very much be interested in uh, having your views on uh, uh you know at it the asean uh, or the asean way that you you know term it you know to uh, this broader debate on asian diplomatic practices or non western diplomatic practices uh so uh, over to the next speaker now uh a next speaker is miss uh, julia sofia kusela she is a student the, Res- the russian presidential academy of national economy and public administration now the paper that she's going to speak on is again very interesting and the title is unveiling tibetan factor in sino india relations so over to julia now julia your time starts now you have 10 minutes uh good afternoon am i audible yes you are thank you i am delighted to join uh, this insightful uh, session and to be among such prominent scholars and uh, as we all know uh, strategic ambitions have been fueling the tensions between 
aging and daily. On, I believe that unveiling type disease factor in uh, Sino-Indian relations would give us a better idea of what really shapes security agendas. Although current economic ties are characterized by more intense cooperation and uh, sort of involvement uh, of both parties, then the political dialogue is uh, there is a range of uh, controversial and problematic uh, disbalances. For example, uh, India's uh, trade deficit with uh, India is uh, perceived considerable with uh, regards to gradual efforts from the Indian side to reduce uh, the share of Chinese imported goods, uh, while emphasizing the importance of the Made in India campaign. The second point is that uh, notably foreign direct uh, investment ratio is uh, undoubtedly a crucial part of bilateral economic engagement and uh, it is mainly uh, startups being one of the key destinations. FDI restrictions uh, issued by Berry in April 2020, which encompass an obligatory approval process for border states companies, it came off as a sort of a response uh, to the threat of opportunistic acquisitions followed by the stock prices drop in the pandemic settings. Nonetheless, uh, overall, this economic partnership is not negative. It is of reciprocal interest, with uh, India being a lucrative market for an abundance of uh, goods and China China contributing uh, crucial imports and money flows into the Indian economy. In turn, uh, Sino-Indian political landscape uh, is shaped by long-standing tensions which have significant impact on foreign policies and uh, national security agendas. This complexity is uh, at to the old its way for becoming the world power while striving to mobilize all growth drivers and eliminate uh, every destabilizing factor. Uh, for example, one of the unresolved uh, issues is uh, Beijing's uh, reluctancy to sign a burdensome river sharing agreement. Another perturbation is China-Pakistan partnership in military political spheres. And uh, given the fact that uh, India has been hesitant to accept the Belt and Road Initiative due to the China-Pakistan economic corridor traversing Jammu and Kashmir, the Indian policy of limited engagement in terms with China is uh, consistently pursued. Undoubtedly, all these uh, multi-directional linkages, they underpin existing bilateral relations where firstly economic interdependence and secondly political confrontation coexist as pivotal at the concealed security concerns amid the constant jeopardy of border clash, uh, amplifies money flows allocated for safeguarding borders. If you look back at the Chinese domestic policy towards politically unstable and economically dependent Tibet Autonomous Region, which shares the border with India, it is possible to observe how Beijing sticks to the tactic of its gradual development. So in accordance, in accordance with the specifics of the historical status of Tibet, the Communist Party of China has maintained a sort of a restricted position on the issue of socio-economic transportation, so with the aim, as not, to provoke an outbreak of national protests. At the time, Tibet was a feudal theocracy with a structurally different approach to management, commerce, outward interactions, and it was essential to align all these practices and bring basic infrastructure. In the 50s, 60s, China launched its first economic policy and supported the agricultural sector. Uh, and by the end of the century, an emphasis was already put on the first zones of economic and technical development in order to lure uh, entrepreneurs by favorable business conditions to attract some side capital to help to boost the local Tibetan economy. At the present stage, uh, Beijing supports uh, developmental programs for the sake of uh, modernizing urban facilities, transport and communication networks, and making use uh, of uh, renewables potential. It is uh, vital for the CPC to have an extensive rail and road system to be able to transfer troops in a military worst case scenario baked up by existing security objects uh, already located in Tibet Autonomous Region. Moreover, throughout decades, uh, 
served as opponents and the beneficiaries of TARS uh, reformation and uh, are some kind, in my opinion, support groups for Beijing while conducting strategic policies here because Tibetans uh, oppose Chinese leadership and repeatedly express dissatisfaction with the unequal rights, demolition of sacred places, and they increase support uh, towards uh, separatist uh, trends. Some Tibetans uh, refugees from the massive diaspora in India, which uh, reinforces the degree of Beijing's uh, mistrust and complexity in India-China engagement. Beijing is also directing substantial money flows into the Tibetan economy in order to contain the social instability. Now, Chinese media shaped the image of the area and outlined TAR's remarkable growth in conjunction with vast natural resources and competitive advantages. But in fact, native inhabitants with skills, education opportunities, and wages, along with the violations of human rights from the Chinese uh, part. The main point here is that successful integration of uh, Tibet, uh, I'm speaking about Tibet Autonomous Region, into the, Taib uh, into the Chinese economy uh, and political setup is on the modern agenda in these highly turbulent uh, border settings and risks uh, related to the loss of political authority in Tibet uh, or incoming foreign support addressed to the local separatists are encrypted in a more assertive approach and oppressive attitude uh, towards uh, Tibetan identity. In turn, uh, Tibet, uh, the Tibetan issue uh, has not been the acute one among Indian policymakers for the last decade, but the recent trend reveals uh, the rising interest in TAR, including the possibility of diplomatic push in bilateral talks uh, launched um, by the PM. So that's it. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. I think uh, that was very interesting indeed. And uh, uh, because we have some time, perhaps one minute, so I'm going to use this time in terms of just flagging off a question which came to my mind. Um, you know, when we really look at China's India policy and China's India's policy uh, is definitely taking a you know, definite direction, uh, particularly when you look at some of the episodes in the last uh, say, uh, you know, two or three years. And uh, the question which comes to my mind that, uh, do you really sh see a shift in uh, China's India's policy? Uh, because uh, China's consolidation over Tibet, you know, politically, militarily. So do you think because China has been able to consolidate its power, what was there, say, by 19, early 1990s, it has been able to successfully consolidate its, consolidate its power economically, militarily. Do you think that this could perhaps uh, be an indication of a shift in China, uh, of a shift uh, in China's India policy? So that's a question for you to contemplate on. Perhaps we can come back to it uh, when we uh, start on with the Q&A round. But uh, now we move on to the next presentation and uh, this is the last presentation also. Uh, so we've done fairly well in managing time. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Ipshita Bhattacharya. She is uh, an assistant professor uh, at Chagrin Lake City University. And uh, well, the title of her presentation is Indo-Pacific Affairs. I'm sure she has something more to add to this title. Over the you have uh, thank you, uh, Medha. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the introduction. Yeah, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement for uh, giving me this platform to share my views. Am I audible to everyone? Yes, you are. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, the subject of my paper without uh, taking much time, I'll just uh, straight away move. Uh, the subject of my paper is Indo-Pacific Affairs Amidst Pandemic, uh, the Geopolitical Inferences. Uh, Till now, I have also, uh, I, I was hearing most of the um, uh, uh, presentations. Uh, it is also similar to that. Uh, let us uh, move to uh, the fundamental portion is how will the COVID-19 change the Indo-Pacific affairs? Although it is too early and too fresh to forecast and uh, predict, but of course, looking into the uh, changing trend, 
and as i'm sure uh, firstly it is clear that covid-19 has re really uh, it has uh, it's a earth shaking health crisis for all of us and it has casted a shadow on all the aspects of our life uh, but uh, let us go to the geopolitical side uh, what it is uh, Uh, giving uh, what kind of uh, trend it is giving us so i have uh, divided my subject into four parts uh, number one is us china dynamic then it is uh, obviously the emergence of uh, quad i would say not emergence it is uh, resurfacing uh, the quad then sec uh, then the third is indo australia relationship and then the geo economic reconfiguration so uh, if we see that currently china and us dynamics are clearly going uh, southwards however the contradictions uh, predate covid 19 situation but the uh, what the wuhan virus has surely hit and sharpened uh, and accelerated hence it has accelerated the process at least under the current leadership of both the countries um, i would say that we can see that the situation might go from a uh, bad to worse the obvious accelerating uh, swing is obviously pushing washington and uh, uh, beijing against each other into the battle of their own narratives uh, for this catastrophic situation uh, as both are seeking legitimacy and uh, i would say the dominance uh, in the in the indo pacific indo pacific region the covid-19 outbreak opens up obvious uh, manifestations in the realms of indo pacific uh, relation i would say so i have certain points let us uh, discuss over them that where us and china are becoming the potential players in the emerging situation the coming years may witness a potential inflation in the intensity between usa and china and obviously hit by the pandemic other regional powers may also get triggered and involved into the situation with india pledging to come up as an economic power by 2025 uh, and also facing china's military adventures in the eastern ladakh area recently uh, we can see that amidst especially amidst this pandemic it's surely paving the way for a global power competition particularly in this region then i would say washington would definitely seize this opportunity and uh, try to increase its involvement in the region by developing and um, emboldening its uh, partnership and uh, relations uh, in the given in this particular uh, area uh, recently uh, us uh, has also laid out that this particular area as a priority theater which indicates that uh, you would like a particular area for a longer time and then also one important thing that the indo pacific us command has recently asked for a uh, Uh, more than 20 billion uh, dollars support uh, to reinforce to to rather strengthen uh, the uh, indo pacific uh, command um, settlement uh, that is uh, in addition uh, especially it is for the term 2021 to 26 now the funds they would be spending on a uh, new radar system then um, joint exercises then uh, intelligence sharing Uh, then military exercises and deployment of uh, new uh, new forces uh, additional forces i would say and obviously the new intelligence uh, sharing systems uh, centers various other centers so i can see that us is uh, 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 in this uh, first uh, assumption which i see that us is was waiting to vent out its contradictions with china which was uh, simmering below somewhere and now it has uh, it is trying to show that there is a, a justification we can say or a probable justified way to come out and uh, uh, and to come out with some kind of uh, Uh, not i would say exactly the rivalry it will be uh, too early to say that but yes there is uh, some kind of intensification of situation will definitely uh, we can foresee for the future now the next part moving on to the next part i would say the formation of quad although formation of quad is um, is is quite uh, it happened in past but it has really resurfaced in this uh, time the current intent basically to develop quad for close coordination and collaboration it seems to be a collective effort to dissipate the message of uh, uh, universal 
respectful respect for the peoples. It mainly calls for the attention as a U.S.-led counterweight model contesting China's uh, pressure and assertiveness in the region. Now, addition of new members like uh, New Zealand, then your uh, Vietnam and South Korea, and uh, probably Israel and Brazil are also uh, possibly joining, although they are not in the Indo-Pacific uh, region, is uh, driven by the logic of convergent security interest under this pandemic in this particular uh, region. Now, the Quad Plus, uh, recently there was a Quad Plus uh, video conferencing which has been started in the month of March. Uh, by uh, U.S. Deputy Secretary Steve Began, in uh, wherein uh, he is involving the ASEAN countries um, uh, and then uh, the, all the Quad members uh, for uh, uh, specifically to see the status of the development of the vaccine, uh, look into this by the citizens and uh, mitigating the economic issues uh, by the lesser privileged countries. So all these things, uh, they are trying to construct uh, this quad and give it a proper structure in this particular, uh, amidst this pandemic, basically. COVID-19 has also pushed Quad to further act on non-traditional security objectives, I would say, aiming at, which is aiming at more at human security against the havoc of the uh, coronavirus. A major role is expected out of potential regional powers with India participating in Quad, uh, uh, with uh, USA and Japan and Australia rising prominently providing uh, a, a good structure to the security concern in this region. Uh, this pandemic has provided a boost to the Indo-Pacific uh, security framework, I would say, as exemplified by the actions of M. Kome. Now, moving out to Indo-Australia relationship, I would say, uh, recently, uh, Tony Walker, uh, the vice chancellor's fellow, uh, his vice chancellor's fellow in La Trobe University, uh, Australia, uh, recently in the conversation media outlet, he gave a statement that uh, Australia and China are currently undergoing a fractured relationship. They are not uh, undergoing a very uh, healthy relationship. Uh, probably this might be because of that Australia asked for a probe into the uh, into the Wuhan virus, uh, the origin of the Wuhan virus. And as a economic penalty, uh, uh, China has also uh, penalized uh, Australia by uh, not importing uh, the beef and the barley from Australia. So many more uh, economic penalties are also uh, imposed on Australia. So probably it can be seen that trail is an, um, of China and India. So that is maybe it's, 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 uh, it's too early to predict that. But yes, maybe Indo-Australian relationship uh, may be an answer for this. So the new defense cooperation deal, which India and Australia unfolds, uh, certain uh, military, more uh, military engagements and sharing technology uh, advancement between them obviously have an agenda to provide security and stability in this region. Now, these relationships have re re recently been uh, upgraded to a comprehensive uh, strategic partnership, uh, which is signed under um, uh, under nine uh, arrangements, including your military logistic sharing for their uh, military engagements. Uh, India and Australia also uh, jointly decided to work uh, collectively and cooperatively through multilateral, regional, and uh, plurilateral mechanism to uh, strengthen CPI, the side chains for uh, uh, critical health technology and other good services also. The joint statement given by uh, Australia and India, it says that we will work together to strengthen international institutions to ensure they are inclusive and rule-based. Somehow this I find that it indicates towards China's assertive role in the South China Sea, wherein it is trying to indicate that China must follow the universal laws. And the last point, uh, am I out of time? Okay, yes. the last One point, I, I'll, just, I'll just go quickly to the last point that is your geoeconomic uh, reconfiguration. Uh, it will bring another tectonic shift in this region, I hope, as a consequence of this pandemic. Uh, significant opportunities and challenges may emerge, uh, especially uh, looking into the global supply chain management. Uh, um, 
manufacturing U USA's effort to bring them back uh, to uh, to increase and to enhance its own economic situation. Now, this economic reconfiguration would also have uh, certain benefits, uh, especially to the regional powers, which would be uh, very crucial, I hope, for China to uh, digest. So here I conclude my presentation. I hope I haven't taken extra time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you all, uh, indeed, you know, to all the panelists here. I think we're very, very disciplined and stuck to time. And I really appreciate this professionalism. Um, so uh, there are a couple of questions which I really see in the chat box. Uh, but yes, Ipshita, there is one question which, of course, comes to my mind before I lose it. Um, you know, can the Asian countries actually take China by its horns? You know, uh, because I mean, there was this article by David Kang, uh, which actually drew my attention right now while you were speaking. When he's really thinking about East Asia, uh, relationship with East Asia in particular, and uh, he says that it's not anarchy that really domin dominates the system, but it's it's hierarchy. And we know that China is militarily, economically, um, uh, it's, it's it's very powerful. Okay. Um, I think there was this paper by uh, Dr. Chibber also, which actually uh, drew our attention to this very distinct ASEAN style diplomacy, which is really about engagement, it's about flexibility, it's about adapting, it's about resilience. And I think when we're really looking at the Asian theater, uh, some of these aspects need to be really looked at more closely, rather than just thinking that perhaps uh, 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 you know, uh, in, in, in the coming times, uh, the Asian theater is really going to be about China and the rest. Uh, this is what uh, my understanding on China's foreign policy uh, at least tells me uh, to say, but I'm sure that uh, you have a uh, reason uh, to uh, have conclude that okay, so views on uh, the same uh, whether uh, you know the Asian countries can really take China by the horns in uh, uh, you know uh, given the uh, change in geopolitics in the region but um, we might just uh, want to go back to these questions which were asked um, I think uh, if I look at the chat box um, there are a couple of questions to Dr. Abiruchi uh, Oja, and um, I think you know the first presentation started at a very different pitch because it primarily talked about uh, issues uh, which critically question the notion of territoriality. Uh, it really uh, questioned uh, you know this gap which often exists between the meta narrative of geopolitics and the micro narratives of the people. So I think that was a very good approach in terms of really looking at the high Himalaya, especially the Hindu Kush range. And one of the questions but which came to my mind while Dr. Ocha was uh, speaking uh, was, uh, you know, when you really talk, you know, who are the people? That? Because if you really look at Ladakh and you look at the societal uh, complexity there, um, you know, Buddhism, for instance, if you take the example of Buddhism, there is this uh, red hat Buddhism and there is this yellow hat Buddhism. And uh, you see that not only uh, the views between them are pretty much polarized, but uh, they also uh, play a very, very important role in terms of whose voice is really being heard. So when you're really talking about the narratives of the people of, of Ladakh, you know, who are these people? Are these the Ladakhi elites? And within these Ladakhi elites also, what are the differences between them? So I think, you know, that's uh, an important aspect which I feel uh, one has to really understand when one is really looking at Ladakhi politics, but at the same time, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to, to really um, understand uh, geopolitics in holistic terms, where you actually take note of the micro narratives along with the macro narratives. There was a question, and this is, uh, let me just go up the chat box. It's not moving up, but... Uh, yeah, I, I can answer both the questions. Yeah. So, uh, so, yeah. So there are two questions. One, uh, uh, in many ways, uh, the ones that are in chat box are related. So the uh, first question was on uh, the recent development in Gal Galwan Valley and how it's going to impact people of uh, Jammu and Kashmir. The second one is about the dual uh, sort of scenario. One is COVID-19 and the other is, uh, of course, uh, what's happening at the, at the border. Uh, this second question is specific to uh, tourism, the experience of uh, tourism. Now, um, uh, let me sort of connect them and give the answer, and then I'm going to come back to the intervention by the chair. Uh, so if we look at uh, uh, the developments that are happening at uh, uh, the 
LACF to sort of sum up in, in one line, it's not going to have an impact on uh, Ladakh per se. And that's one of the points that uh, I was saying. Uh, except for the fact that there's going to be further militarization and concerns have been raised in Ladakh uh, around that, uh, the, this territory that we are talking about is uh, very thinly populated. And that's one of the reasons why, if you look at uh, early history, uh, 17th century onwards, the border that was uh, uh, sort of agreed upon remained more or less same, even if you had Britishers, even if you had uh, the Mughal or Dogra, Dogra regime. So in that sense, there is a continuity of uh, the border. The nation states, of, of course, are extremely assertive. So last uh, about 100 years, you would have more assertion around this line. Uh, and there has been violent conflict 2017. Uh, after 2017, this is the second time that uh, it has become so bloody where uh, army people have lost their life. But it's different on the same side. Uh, so on the other side, uh, when you have in JNK, I'm talking about, uh, and, and remember when I'm talking about JNK, I'm talking about only Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, in Ladakh, uh, when you have uh, violent conflicts happening on uh, LAC, uh, there are no people over there. Uh, so it, it leads to the concerns are about uh, further militarization. But if you talk about Jammu and Kashmir, the UT as of now, uh, the Confrontations that happen, the ceasefire violations, another thing, have direct impact uh, because people get impacted. They have to be moved and all of that. So uh, that's that's sort of interesting point about uh, this uh, sort of uh, confrontation that's happening as of now, uh, and also why uh, it's it's COVID nineteen and also the kind of priority that uh, these two states have uh, about a confrontation in a particular place, uh, which. Uh, uh, which does not have the, the only time that you would have confrontation in this space is during summer because on the other time you can't really be there neither the uh, Indian state or uh, the Chinese state so that's uh, that's one uh, the second is regarding uh, uh, tourism now uh, tourism in Ladakh was allowed 1975 so it's been about uh, 40, 45 to 55 years of span when tourism has been happening uh, though tourism is one of the main aspects of uh, the economy in uh, in Ladakh, there is also ag agriculture, uh, and there is also uh, the presence of military and military-related market that has been created. So there was a shift that happens once uh, in 1975, uh, tourism was allowed. In fact, if you look at the question uh, that were being raised under the discussion that started happening after 370 in Ladakh was like, okay, fine, so we are a UT, we are no more and in Jammu and Kashmir. How to go about? And uh, this uh, stress on tourism uh, was something that came up again and again uh, among intellectuals, among civil society as one of the uh, problem areas. Uh, tourism as of now for the world uh, uh, is, is not happening due to COVID-19. Uh, uh, so that's not extraordinary for uh, Ladakh per se. Any uh, region which is dependent on tourism is facing the same kind of problem. But if you look at the discourse that has happened after August, uh, the focus more or less has been like, uh, one has to really move the shift uh, on uh, tourism and maybe perhaps go back in reviving uh, the agricultural economy in a different manner in a more responsible manner, uh, which, uh, which can be more inclusive and also uh, be uh, responsible uh, to the fragile e eco uh, uh, system over there. So this, this is my uh, uh, in the JN, uh, yeah, uh, JNK has opened for uh, tourism. Uh, Ladakh is a UT still. So, I mean, in our imagination, people still sort of refer to them together. Uh, now let's uh, coming to uh, the respond uh, the sort of uh, intervention uh, by the chair. Uh, thank you so much for bringing this point up. Anybody who's talking about Ladakh, uh, any responsible social scientist would uh, would be aware about the intersectionality of identity, uh, and also the the layers of hierarchy that are operative. So you would have Leh and you would have Kargil. So not only the fact that the red hat and the yellow hat, uh, you know, distinction, and that I sort of slightly mentioned even in case of Tibet. So though there may be shared history, but politically and historically, uh, there is a different trajectory that, that uh, Ladakh chose for itself. And that brings
and say religiousism is also brings it uh, within the Indian fold. Um, and on the other hand, uh, you would also have uh, this distinction, not only within Le, but also the distinction between Le and, and Kargil. So when one is talking about uh, the silencing of voices, uh, I, my reference point as of now would be, uh, you have a lot of academic work coming out of Ladakh, fascinating and very bright uh, people uh, uh, with a lot of nice work, but there is a silence. Uh, on, on the side of Indian academia and uh, elsewhere as well. Um, and within the elite as well. So those who are talking about what is going to be the impact are not the people, uh, because uh, it's not that people aren't talking. Uh, the Taki people are talking. Nobody is listening. That's, that's the point that I was talking about. So I or anybody else uh, who would be touching upon uh, Ladakh is aware about first of identity also, also had a distinction between Leh and Kargil and sort of few points over there. Uh, uh, so that's there. But uh, I would also say that uh, one has to uh, look at uh, the voices that's there, but uh, the voices that we don't want to listen to. And that would be a good uh, beginning point. And there's fabulous work, uh, very fascinating work that's coming out of. So that would be my response to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Because I think, uh, you know, this is something which we really miss in India when we're really talking about these micro spaces or micro, like, uh, particularly Ladakh, you know, which, which is very small, but I think it has such rich culture. And uh, going back to a conversation, I was told that in case you want to study Ladakh, you need to actually spend around 10 years in Ladakh, knowing the language and the culture and the sensibility. So uh, thank you for that. And I do hope that we get to see your paper in print, uh, I definitely would be looking uh, very forward to reading it once it is done so. Just next, there are a lot of questions. Uh, anyone, I think there was just one for Dr. Chibber. Um, and uh, so any other questions? If someone can just monitor the questions because... <laughs> so there is one for, uh, for, for Dr. Chibber. Dr. Chibber, uh, did you uh, just... Uh, read the questions which are uh, primarily directed at you. There is one question by Muhammad Ahmad Raza, and that's to everyone in the panel. Uh, due to COVID-19, as we are witnessing throughout the world, which has badly affected the daily wage labor, the vulnerable section of the society. In the context of the dark, the attack is twofold. Okay, the pandemic and the tension. Okay, you did mention to I think uh, Dr. Oja did uh, refer to it. But over to you, Dr. Chibar, if you uh, yeah, want to respond yeah. to any of the questions. Sure. Thank yeah, uh, I think uh, yeah, uh, one of the participants has um, asked about uh, China and ASEAN relations, and how China is trying to uh, break ASEAN solidarity, uh, especially in the context of China Sea. Uh, well, see, that's the whole point. That's what I was talking about. The whole point of resilience um, of ASEAN. Uh, it is not the first time that uh, ASEAN members have different perceptions about China. For example, in the present context, also in the Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, Indonesia actually wants China to be included. That's why the inclusive word. And this is how it has been criticized by others, you know, because America says free. When it uses the word free, it means free from China's aggressive posture, you know. So this is not the first time. And um, uh, when uh, Hague Tribunal actually gave the verdict against China um, in the Philippines case, you know, um, building artificial islands in South China Sea. It refused to, uh, it refused to actually follow that, you know. So it is not the first time uh, that the members have differences, but ASEAN as a grouping uh, stopped them from taking this uh, decision so far, uh, these differences so far that ASEAN breaks up. Uh, so that's the whole point, because I remember in 2016, in this consensus, uh, these members said that probably China can deal with individual countries rather than dealing with ASEAN as a whole. But still, even today, China is dealing with ASEAN as a whole, whether it's complementary in terms of trade or whether it's differences. You know. And uh, then there's another question, which is about, um, I can see, which is about, um, yeah, okay, uh, see, uh, it's about in Indo-Pacific, which I can see. Uh, Basically, um, yeah, India and um, uh, ASEAN converge. They converge in many areas uh, because um, ASEAN also see many res in many respects here uh, India as a balancer, as a balancer to China. 
and i'm be happy any ideas many points where it was even said that probably india can play a more proactive role in terms of a security provider to asean in the in the in indo pacific region or the indian ocean and south china sea so yes and uh, your second part of your question uh, talks about asean way uh, if you remember that's how i started my paper that asean way or the norms of the asean way are not exactly unique non interference or um, not to resort to force is not or even our panchil principle for that matter our panchamrit principle now talks about the same things you know but asean actually adapted it uh, to the local level and actually ensured that it fructifies you know it results in this consensus building it results in this resilience and the last uh, important thing i think medha you pointed out a very important uh, um, uh post best diplomatic and ir approach so uh, coming to that well i'll say there are uh, three different um, perspectives one is about uh, because uh, the european countries or the western countries they have their own 100 year wars and long industrialization process of nationhood uh, behind them and compared to them we have been very new we have been uh, colonial artifacts you know we got freedom after a long um, uh long times of colonization so one we jealously guard our sovereignty right so nothing like european union can work in in south asia or or southeast asia or even in other countries you know uh that is one point the second point again when we talk about the ir narrative or the diplomatic practices western or the european is more about power politics but if you have a look at the is a is more human centric approach you know a multilateral kind of approach again a consensus building kind of approach so these are the divergent uh, 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 points about the diplomatic and the ir practices which uh, further need to be uh, brought out i am i'm working on another paper which is on on kotalia's diplomatic practices basically on rajne so probably sometime i'll share with that also with you so that actually talks about indian diplomatic practices yeah. Okay. thank you thank you because this is one caveat a gap which i currently see uh, mm -hmm. in the literature particularly on diplomatic studies because it's been so so highly influenced uh, mm -hmm. by the experiences of europe and i think uh, we need to really inform it by some of these asian non western or you know what amitabh acharya terms as global ir so uh, but i think in the field of diplomacy we need to emancipate and uh, embolden some of these thoughts so that uh, we need to think of international relations in general um any other questions uh, which are there i could really see it in the chat box but then yes uh, if our other uh, speakers want to really respond to some specific questions the so ones perhaps which i had raised uh, you can uh, respond to them we had victoria who primarily talked about uh, migration and um, how uh, migration is really sort of central to china uh, russia uh, relations um if yes if you want to ask a question yeah thank you I, i would like to answer this um thank you for the question it's really migration is one of um, i can say uh very important in russia china relations i can say it's the major one uh it is uh, of course in the core and especially um in people to people relations is very important same time now i could say russia and china focus more on even economic relations and uh, uh the formulating uh, the future and prospects of uh, a uh, common cooperation on one belt one road of course uh, uh russia has some uh, i would say doubts about that but uh, sees it as one of the important projects in the whole eurasia and uh, in the region for the region economic union as well and migration uh, is important uh, for many uh, integration uh, i can say projects uh, which russia is one of the leading countries uh, in Uh, including uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, including the Eurasian Economic Union, I mentioned, and uh, migration here is uh, probably connected to the question of security because uh, uh, uncontrolled migration can uh, lead to some criminality, 
as a student for, for issues to uh, cooperate on, to discuss. And China here can as well help and to, to uh, um, uh, help in, I mean, uh, sharing information in cooperation uh, with the migration, uh, uh, some flows and so on. But as well, there is the case of, um, a bit of those problems which I mentioned, I mean, tourism, uh, Chinese-oriented tourism, uh, some uh, Chinese business uncontrolled and so on in the Far East uh, regions. And uh, here I think that uh, both local governments and government of Russia should, of course, uh, cooperate, not cooperate, but elaborate uh, much more so the legislation would be clear and uh, it would pursue interests both of the Russian, Russian nation and uh, Chinese as well, uh, as it's... Uh, uh, as it's uh, 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 useful for Russia. So, uh, thank you. Well, that's a very interesting aspect, I think, to look at, particularly for students of international relations, again, because uh, you're really looking at two facets here. You're really looking at the interaction between migration and foreign policy, which is definitely one important aspect, but also migration and development. And I think that was one aspect which you were also really trying to highlight in your presentation. Um, and um, I think, uh, you know, more research uh, definitely needs to be put into it. So I'm so, so thankful to you that you actually brought this perspective to the table today. Um, we have Manisha here. Uh, Manisha, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I, I would like to answer the question of the chair raised itself. Uh, you had asked about the Chinese perspective. How do they perceive uh, terms like war, peace, and power? Uh, my paper also did attempt to look at how, why China, won't, uh, how China, why China is responding in this particular way. But it, where especially came for this imposition of its own values on China. So Shen Dingli, a very prominent Chinese scholar, he said that you cannot expect China to behave in any other way because it has a very different perception of its national interest uh, in a, in comparison to how U.S. perceives it. So it will continue doing so and until the other nations, the challenging challenging nations, you know, accept or at least come to the table to discuss how China perceives its own, uh, it perceives its interest. So I, I do have to look more deeply into this and I would thank the chair for pointing it out. Uh, thank you, you know, because uh, I think when you really look at this literature around China and IRT, international relations theory, I think a lot has been coming out, you know, a lot has been coming out. And uh, one really needs to engage with some of these ideas, I feel, because uh, they really do give you a different perspective on the way China thinks, because there are different geographies of thought. They should also become important in terms of understanding the responses, particularly when we are talking about policy responses uh, in specific. So um, there is one particular book which I, I really liked. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of the author. Maybe it was by Wen Li, but he's really talked about relationality and international relations, you know, from a Chinese perspective. And um, it's 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 really wonderful because uh, you know when you really try to understand. Uh, how states think or how nations think, I think, you know, that really becomes uh, an entry point uh, for you to really contribute again to say international relations, which I would say is, is a bit ethnocentric because, you know, our international relations theories themselves are inspired by Western political thought. So, uh, so on that note, uh, maybe I can just move on. Thank you. Uh, thank you for responding to this question, Manisha. Um, uh, we have uh, Sampriti here. Sampriti, would you like to uh, respond to any questions which have, or things you want to further add in terms of uh, clarifying uh, what you have to say? You know, there was one thing which, which in fact came to my mind. And, and of course, you know, that's an interesting uh, puzzle. You in fact draw for yourself and then you want to really answer it. But, um, but uh, you know, I was just wondering, uh, Sampriti, uh, what, what is really the main argument that you are really trying to highlight here? Uh, when we are really talking about Russia, Ch uh, India, Chai ties, uh, you know, they being central. And I think, you know, um, given that uh, contemporary geopolitics is changing, uh, one needs to uh, really look at, uh, you know, how are these uh, actors now negotiating with each other? You know, what's the kind of pattern which is emerging? Um, what is the primary argument, you know, uh, you would actually offer us uh, when it really comes to Russia, India, China, uh, Russia, India ties? Do you think the geopolitics 
politics uh, with the US uh, um, and India, but that's, I think, uh, you know, that's temporary. I mean, that's just sort of restricted to uh, Trump. Uh, there's always been a love-hate relationship when it really comes to Indo-US relations. Uh, so one cannot really say that they are for permanent. And of course, you know, the strategic sort of schools which are there in India, or, you know, regarding Indo-US relations, they are, uh, you know, varying thoughts, uh, which really talk about the way or the trajectory that India-US relations should take to. But um, uh, any specific sort of an argument you have here, um, uh, which, you know, uh, can help us understand better that, uh, uh, you know, uh, that Russia-India relations are definitely going to take a specific direction, uh, given the changes which are really happening. You know, what, are, what do you say? I mean, would it really be just moving in a much more cooperative uh, fashion? Will, 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 will we be seeing Russia and India coming together? Or, or, or on the other hand, you uh, have a trajectory sort of, you know, evolving when it really comes to India-Russia uh, relations? Oh, well, thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, what I wish to highlight is like uh, post-2014, especially after the Crimean crisis, uh, the West was quick to put uh, sanctions on Russia. So Russia was suffering, like the economy was suffering. So it was precisely at this moment that Russia uh, uh, wanted to recalibrate its uh, ties with Pakistan and also it, it came up with this uh, comprehensive um, cooperative agreement with China. So most scholars have, have are terming this, uh, this engagement, Russia's engagement with China and Pakistan as a counter alliance to India and US. And that is precisely what I refute in my paper. I say that, uh, like what I wish to highlight is that this is not uh, an axis or an alliance because there are a certain, uh, uh, there are like uh, Russia shares a very, uh, an historical a historical relationship with India, which is uh, which is invested across all spheres, and it is very unlikely for Russia uh, to uh, to uh, like to re recalibrate its ties with China and Pakistan to the extent of uh, turning against India. So that is what my paper wanted to highlight that uh, we should uh, stop uh, uh, seeing relations like, between countries as a zero sum game it is not that uh, the, the the relation with it is not to say that there are no confrontation issues between russia and china or russia and pakistan of course there are but then russia also wants to cooperate and since russia is cooperating with uh, china and pakistan on a number of issues it does not mean that russia is betraying india we get out of this Russia is uh, collaborating with uh, Pakistan who, uh, who doesn't share a good relation with India. That means that Russia is turning its back uh, to India. That is not the case. And uh, ma'am, as far as uh, Russia's uh, relation with India is concerned, uh, it is uh, like, of course, there is, uh, it is moving in, um, in a very good direction, uh, if I may say so. Uh, and, and in all spheres, uh, may, uh, like the economy, the military, uh, the strategic level, at all levels, the relationship has been extremely invested. But at the same time, I don't want to equate like how it is how Russia India relation relationship is faring vis-a-vis -vis Russia's relations with China or with Pakistan. That would be very restrictive. And uh, I think uh, scholars in international relations have mostly done that in their writings and analysis. And I think we need to get out of that trap. There is nothing to you know uh, equate. It. A nation that these and uh, the kind of relation Russia has with India is in no way jeopardizing its ties with other Asian countries, or for that matter, the kind of recalibration it's having with Pakistan or China doesn't at any cost mean that uh, it is going to be harmful for Russia India ties. On the contrary, what I argue is uh, if Russia is actually able to collaborate with China and Pakistan on the Afghan issue. Then uh, and uh, bring India on the table, then uh, through uh, like backdoor diplomacy or otherwise, it is going to be beneficial for India to have a say on Afghanistan, whose stability, of course, has a bearing on our own uh, territorial integrity. So, ma'am, that is the crux of uh, my uh, argument. Thank you. Very well said. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, those are very sharp insights indeed. So, uh, thank you, uh, Sampriti. We have thank one you. question here, um, and I think this just come uh, in the ongoing situation
occupation of China. Why leaders like Mr. Oli is not against China like Australia is? And, can, can any, and anyone can answer this. Uh, so maybe before we just move on, I'm keeping the last five minutes for this question, but there are two other speakers here. And um, maybe uh, moving on to our uh, next speaker, uh, uh, Julia. Julia, would you like to say something? Julia and Ipshita. You can also take this question if you want, but there is, yes, this question on Tibet-China relations, uh, Tibet, this triad on uh, China, Tibet, and India, which I had, if you would like to respond to that, you might. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, yes, uh, considering uh, I would like to address your question that you put forward uh, right after my uh, presentation. Uh, there is uh, such a complex and multi-directional uh, motions that happens between China and India because uh, as for the Beijing stance, uh, it, it uh, tries to develop as the boat is uh, really notable is, uh, is that um, the stake of the governmental help in the local budget reaches up to 90%, which is an unprecedented percentage. If we compare with uh, other uh, provinces in China, so it puts uh, a lot of money, a lot of efforts, but it's just to the Beijing's uh, liking, if we can say so. Uh, from the point of view of Delhi, it realizes uh, gradual efforts uh, and massive, even massive efforts uh, put into its uh, reformation. Uh, and uh, China itself uh, is uh, very well aware, uh, aware, is conscious of uh, Indian stance of. Of Tibet and uh, uh, on the Tibetan uh, diaspora in uh, India and um, Delhi uh, may use it uh, as a tool in the diplomatic talk may bring uh, this issue because uh, it uh, is undeniable that uh, the Chinese uh, diaspora in India is uh, uh, big enough to have any impact and to have a say in its, uh, uh, in its power to influence even um, administrative integrity of China in uh, some worst case uh, scenario, it may happen. So uh, when we analyze these modern trends, we see that uh, with the Indian PM, Narendra, Mo Narendra Modi, uh, he is putting forward the Tibet card. He is ready to push forward uh, the talks with, uh, the, with Tibet. And uh, we will see what comes from that because the, um, the deal in these affairs are ongoing and it's uh, yet to see, yet to come what will what may happen because it's just my uh my thought maybe my conception that uh, india may play its card uh, as a diplomatic push against uh, china as it did with hong kong for example so that's a very interesting insight uh uh you know just a few days back it was the Lai Lama's birthday and I think um, India restrained from wishing the Lai Lama so you know it's it's really uh, uh, it's, it's it's really uh, you know the choices which India is really also making in the public domain in terms of asserting itself but at the same time being very very cautious as not to offend China but then as uh, the times are fragile as uh, the situation is quite fluid um, definitely uh, I think what happens in the high Himalayas is, 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 is something to really look at for, for strategic analysis. Uh, we can now move on to Ipshita. Ipshita, if you uh, want to uh, address any of these questions, uh, which is there, there is one question by the speaker and uh, he's pretty curious about uh, why is it that leaders uh, um, uh, like Mr. O uh, uh, are not countries uh, are. If anyone wants to uh, take this question, uh, you please welcome to. But uh, Ipshita, if you want to respond to any specific questions, I mean, that would be very nice. There was this specific question, I think, which we had, uh, which I had uh, proposed your paper. Uh, if you can respond to that, that would be, um, that would, I would really appreciate that. Ipshita, are you there? Okay, so I think we've lost Ipshita because I can't see her here, but, uh, so, so we can go into the second round now because I cannot really see her. I can't figure her out. Uh, maybe she's lost her connection. Uh, but uh, maybe uh, if any of uh, our presenters here would like to respond uh, to this question, uh, which has just come. Mr. Oli. Uh, 
uh, why is this not like here? I know this is not really related to your presentation, but I think there was one question uh, way back um, and there was one uh, person who said that why is no one really talking about Hong Kong? Uh, so uh, I think there was some mention to it. Uh, and of course, the context matters. But if you want to really take these uh, questions head on, uh, please do. Otherwise, uh, uh, we have um, another six minutes. Yes, we have around another six minutes. We can utilize them. Uh, I guess I can take uh, Chandra Gupta Maurya's question. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so in answer to why leaders like you know small nations like Nepal are not responding is because we saw what happened to Australia when Australia responded. Uh, when Australia took the case uh, of, you know, they wanted to have an investigation into the origins of coronavirus, uh, China responded extremely uh, harshly. They imposed uh, and, uh, and even the recent cyber attack in Australia, Australia blamed China for it. So Chinese response is not this sort of Chinese response, not something small nations can want to, you know, uh, think about and particularly countries like Nepal that, you know, are benefiting out of relations with China. I don't think they will want to respond or attack uh, China, particularly now when that's the only nation that's surviving and everyone else is struggling with the virus. Thank you. That's well said. That's well said. I think well answered. Uh, anyone who wants to take a chance on that? But I think you sum it up very well. Anyone who wants to take a chance on that? So, yes? No? All right. Uh, so I hope you got your answer. And, uh, you know, as uh, far as, uh, I mean, I would, you know, broad we agree uh, between China, India, uh, China, Nepal relations, you know, need to be really looked at. And particularly, I think it's also, uh, you know, I mean, there are two specific points which at least come to my mind right now. Uh, you know, first is, is this wave of nationalism, which is really going on, uh, you know, uh, 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 in the present era. And uh, definitely uh, what we're really seeing in Nepal uh, uh, right now is, is really a consequence to that. I think India-Nepal relations are really, you know, down at the bottom at this point of time. And uh, for many reasons for many reasons and that is one thing you know which you which one needs to understand when we are really trying to uh, study South Asian politics is that the domestic and the external are really really intertwined and uh, perhaps uh, you know one of the reasons as to uh, why Oli seems to be more inclined towards uh, China rather than any other country is is because uh, of these uh, domestic sort of uh, you know is of, of the asymmetry, as Manisha pointed out, between uh, you know China and and India. But also, uh, one has to really understand uh, the individual factor, the personality factor in foreign policy, and uh, Oli's personality in that context, you know, becomes uh, uh, very uh, very important. Uh, so uh, I think uh, you know this is also in many ways uh, Nepal is moving away uh, from its uh, um, fr from its most talked about policy of being equidistant. You know, till now we had been sort of familiar with this word equidistant that India will be uh, that Nepal will be equidistant when it really comes to China and India. But definitely with Oli coming into power, that has changed, and we are really seeing a definite orientation towards China. Uh, but of course, uh, domestic politics, uh, personality of Oli maybe would. Uh, give some answers to your question. That's true. So um, we almost uh, have two minutes now. I think uh, we utilized the time well. I uh, would uh, thank all the audiences uh, who were very patiently listening uh, to our presenters. I think this was an exceptionally um, enlightening session, at least for me, because of the range of topics that we really touched on. Um, and I think understanding China becomes very important. And particularly when we sitting in South Asia and China is really, you know, uh, is, is the new neighbor now. China is very much uh, in uh, South Asia, be it uh, de jure or de, uh, de facto. You know, it's, it's very, very much uh, here in South Asia. And um, I think understanding China, not only vis-a-vis, not only vis-a-vis -vis South Asia is important, but understanding China vis-a-vis -vis Central Asia, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, Russia, vis-a-vis -vis Southeast Asia becomes very, very important for, for, for any of the countries or the neighboring countries of China. 
uh, in that uh, corner, perhaps the organizers, um, you know, did pretty well in terms of balancing the session because the theme of the session was China's neighborhood. And the moment when you're talking about China's neighborhood in South Asia, you inevitably get the South Asia factor to mind. But then here, I think that's a wonderful job done by them that they broadened the debate. They broadened the debate to other actors, to other issues, which I think needs to be really looked at when you're looking at China's foreign policy or China's brand strategy, as one of our young panelists called it. Um, so wonderful if uh, we can just clap for our panelists, uh, unmute ourselves, and uh, I think that was a wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank everyone. It was a wonderful session. And I would especially like to thank our moderator, paper presenters, and it was a wonderful session. Please join us for the next session. Thank you.